Yeah. All right, everybody. Thanks for coming out um, for our post Thanksgiving holiday. Okay. And uh, we're really happy to have Larry Crowder here, who's the science director for the Center for Ocean Solutions and also a professor at Hopkins Marine Station and Lab from uh, run by Stanford University. And uh, Larry is an old colleague of Mike Orbach's, who was here a weeks back. They were at Duke together, so kind of uh, did a back-to-back -back, um, lecture from that crowd. And uh, and you know, Larry is one of the preeminent marine scientists in the country and probably the world. So I don't really have. Uh, I'll let him tell. You're gonna be much more interested in listening to him than me. So uh, without further ado, welcome and thank you very much. interesting challenge where people say he's going to be interesting so, <laughs> so if, if turkey torpor kicks in I understand I'll try to stay awake for the next uh, about an hour um, but um, so I want, to, I want to give you a little introduction to Center for Ocean Solutions um, what attracted me to leave Duke University and come out here is this really crappy place that I have to live in the Mill Valley and Monterey Peninsula and all that kind of stuff but the, the intrigue of co-directing a center that actually claims it's going to solve problems is pretty cool. And for uh, young, aggressive minds, like most of the students in this room, they're a little bit tired of studying the demise of the oceans and they want to fix things, or the studying the demise of environmental uh, uh, things that they care about. And so I'm going to give you a little introduction to the Center for Marine Solutions, its history, but I'm going to try to focus on some of the things that we've done in the last couple of years that we think are really innovative, new research, or solutions-oriented approaches, or whatever, just to show you the variety of things that we, that we do. Let's see if we can do this right. So, you know, as you know, we're, we're blessed all over the world with really rich coastal systems that have really high, high productivity, the highest productivity. And we live right here on the edge of one of the highest productivity zones in the ocean in the California current upwelling ecosystem there a half a dozen upwelling ecosystems around the world, and that's where the bulk of the ocean productivity occurs. Um, and so it's a really important place that produces a lot of uh, ecosystem goods, goods and services, the things that benefit people. And of course, you all participate in a lot of those kinds of benefits. And so the oceans are actually actively used, not just here in Monterey Bay, but around the world for a whole variety uh, of different uses that we really love, whether it's in or on the water, um, you know, this is an amazing place because you can go out on a whale watch boat and see 12 species of marine mammals in a day uh, in, in a couple hours, and that's just, if you don't appreciate that magic, you should. It's really cool. But because humans intensely use the oceans, there are impacts to everything that we do uh, in ocean ecosystems that, that challenge those ecosystems in terms of nutrient loading, hypoxic, uh, that generate hypoxic water, uh, heavy metals and so on, uh, oil spills. Um, in fact, uh, you know, if you ask the American public, you poll the American public, what's the number one problem in oceans? They say oil spills. And I would say occasionally, acutely, but the issues are much broader than oil spills. And a lot of the, um, the chronic issues about uh, nutrient pollution and uh, overfishing and stuff is probably more serious. So, so, so Ocean Solutions was formed uh, with a founding grant from Packard Foundation uh, back in 2008. Um, and what we claim we're going to try to do is take on major problems facing the oceans and then prepare leaders to do that. So when, when you say you're taking on major problems <coughs> for the oceans, you're immediately into interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary space. The kind of science that I do as a marine ecologist or an oceanographer is necessary but not sufficient to solve these problems. You need to understand that the human dimensions of the issues, you need to understand governance, you need to understand laws, you need to understand um, how to integrate those things together uh, so that if you're shooting for solutions that lead to sustainability, it has to work for the environment and for the people or you haven't found a sustainable solution. Uh, and uh, a lot of people solve the problem for the environment at major cost to the people uh, and those solutions often aren't sustainable. Uh, or they solve problems for people in the ocean degrades. And so working in this interdisciplinary space is really exciting 
to me. Um, the three partners for Center for Ocean Solutions from the founding uh, was Stanford University, both Hopkins Marine Station and the Woods Institute, the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, and the Monterey Bay Aquarium. And so the center was formed to sit between those organizations and try to foster crosstalk between those organizations that have really different missions. Monterey Bay Aquarium is an oceanography, deep sea exploration, instrumentation kind of shop. It's where all the boys with toys and some girls with toys want to live. Um, and if you don't get, if you haven't been to a bar, you should go. Uh, you've seen the aquarium from the front side. Uh, I encourage you to get a behind the scenes tour sometime if you can arrange that to see how those things really happen, the magic that you see on the front side. Um, and then the aquarium also has a big uh, research and policy arm uh, that operates right over here um, at the top of the wharf. So in, in the process, what we're trying to do is, is not recognize that you can solve problems, every problem, uh, right off the bat, but to design pathways to solutions so that we're, we're hoping that we can bridge the gap between science and policy, we can engage all the appropriate thinkers who think about these issues from different perspectives, and actually get to solving some of these major challenges that face the oceans. Um, the team of people uh, who work with us in the center right now is a little over 20 people, and that includes uh, uh, economists, lawyers, uh, uh, biologists, oceanographers, um, social scientists, geographers, so it's a very diverse group of people. Um, we have uh, senior staff uh, who are more or less permanent people of about only eight or something. We have a half a dozen postdocs that we call early career fellows because they aren't just research postdocs like biology postdocs, they're JDs, they're MBAs, right? Uh, so they have the advanced degree in their field and so inherently everything that we do is interdisciplinary teams focused on environmental problem solving. And so we take these kinds of ranges of approach to uh, dealing with issues where we're trying to define uh, and measure or figure out ways to measure the health of the oceans, uh, to research the causes of threats, to communicate with key stakeholders because they have to be, you have to uh, come to a common understanding of what the problems are and work to co-create solutions. Um, we need to recognize that not only new knowledge, but potentially new technologies will be required to solve these problems. And since that's what Ambari does is technology, uh, that's a key. Uh, but ultimately, this information has to get to decision makers and, uh, and actually get into practice. And uh, an integral part of our program is to train students to do this kind of interdisciplinary work. And MIS is an interesting place to come talk about this because it's an interdisciplinary program from the get-go. But most of the universities have these siloed departments where you learn oceanography and you would never learn anything about water policy. <laughs> or you learn ecology and you would never learn anything about human geography um, uh, or political ecology. So um, what we do is serve as that interdisciplinary glue for programs around around the bay. Um, <clears throat> we work with a wide variety of people and a lot of the work, uh, some of the work is done in the field, some of the work is done in the laboratory, a lot of the work is engaging people uh, from a wide uh, variety of perspectives uh, who are up close and personal with the problem. So a lot of times in the room there are stakeholders, there are practitioners, there are also university scientists and so on to discuss. Let's agree on, see if we can come to an agreement on what the problems are and then think about these pathways to solutions and what might be possible to implement. Um, we have a lot of different groups that uh, we work with uh, in terms of funding, our government agencies, non-governmental agencies, NGOs, and so on. That, and this is just a short list of recent partners uh, on projects that we've done over the last five or six years. Um, so ultimately, we're, you know, to get at the details of what we do and how we do it, um, our goal is to try to uh, give information to decision makers that allow them to make better decisions in terms of sustainability that can benefit people and the, the biophysical ecological system. Um, and, and, and basically the whole notion is to co-create with people who have, have different ways of knowing about the system pathways to solutions that can be considered. So we don't suggest a particular solution, we don't advocate a particular solution, we're a think tank 
that helps think about how these solutions could be put into place. So the steps that we make on this knowledge to action spectrum include sometimes building understanding, um, and often in this space it involves uh, generating interdisciplinary collaborations. And some people like fall into this business with a good interdisciplinary sense, but a lot of people are actually trained very narrowly disciplinarily, and so building that interdisciplinary uh, uh, facility is really important. And, and this, again, is a really interesting place because it started as a language institute, right? And so if, if somebody said to me, I want to do international diplomacy, I would say, how many languages do you know? <laughs> you don't have to know them well, but you have to be able to speak a lot of languages. And you have to be able to speak enough to somebody who speaks German to be able to communicate. And maybe they think the deep thinking and they talk to other people in German, but they come back to you. Um, if you want to do interdisciplinary problem solving, in the oceans, it's how many disciplines do you know? And you don't have to be a kick-ass economist, but you have to know how to talk to an economist and how to engage an economist in the problems that you're trying to address. Um, and, uh, and this is a hard one. The second one for most academics uh, is that uh, we need to, if we're solutions oriented, we need to design our research agendas based on what decision makers need, not what we want to study. I mean, most scientists are taught to be curiosity driven. You study whatever school that you think is neat. And then you try to inflict that on the decision makers like it will be useful to them. Right? And they frequently come back saying, that's a lovely red rock that you've given me, but I really need a green rock. So thanks. Thank you very much. It's pretty, but it's not helping me. And most scientists, including me, started out thinking there's science and policy and a big arrow that goes from science to policy. Science informs policy. But in fact, if you're going to solve problems in the real world, the request, the design of what the research needs to be, needs to come from the policymakers' needs to the scientists. That's not something academic scientists are trained to do. Um, those of us who do that now learn by doing it wrongly for years or decades mm -hmm. until we realize you want to fix a problem in the real world, you have to talk to the people who would make decisions around those problems. <clears throat> It's really important to uh, emphasize communication and engagement. So a lot of what we do is synthesizing existing information and trying to convert it into uh, material that's practical, credible, and relevant. Um, and uh, people, scientists complain all the time about public policy not taking into account science. But a lot of that's due to scientists being absolutely bad communicators about what the key science issues are and why you should care, you know? And uh, some people say we now live in a, a post-fact world, uh, mm -hmm. but prior to the election, we also lived in a fact-neutral world at best, where just having compelling science doesn't get things done. You need to communicate that science in a way that's useful. And so one of the key roles that we play at the center is convening, mediating, translating, uh, among the people who have different ways of knowing about the problem from what they see as very practical and what they need as decision makers to what scientists can produce and offer to them. And then you work in a co-creation kind of way with the managers and the decision makers and the scientists uh, to develop um, solutions that they can consider implementing. And keep in mind, we don't implement the solutions, that's somebody in government. Uh, formal or informal governance in some setting makes the decisions. I mean, if you're, I'll talk later about managing small-scale fisheries. Uh, that Those decisions are made at the level of communities in some places. Uh, but managing fisheries are also made at the level of the individual fisherman. She decides whether to abide by the regulations or not, right? So if the regulations don't make sense to her, she doesn't comply, right? So ultimately, the solutions have to be <clears throat> discussed and hammered out. And this is all really hard work. I mean, that's why scientists would rather publish their paper in a high-profile journal and walk away and say, ooh, I did a good thing, right? Rather than doing the hard work that it takes. And so when we started out, <clears throat> we had these three focal areas, and these are big buckets. So it has to do with marine ecosystem health, the impact of climate change on oceans, and land-sea interactions. And a lot of people think about land-sea interactions as the impact of runoff or landscape practices on water quality and water. That's one way those things go. But there's also impacts of oceans on land and on terrestrial resources, in this case with climate change and weather and coastal 
hazards and all that kind of stuff. There's big issues at this edge of the ocean. Uh, we do a little bit of work in the open sea, but most of it is in coastal zones is because that's where the intensity of the interaction between people and the environment are most intense. Right? So we work where the problems are hard. Uh, a lot of oceanographers start in water greater, deeper than 200 meters because it's easy <laughs> to work um, mm -hmm. on the physics and so on in deep oceans compared to coastal zones. When we thought about how we actually do things in practice, we came up with this idea of solution spaces. And these are different kind of ways that we try to get to solving problems that have to do uh, with issues in the ocean. Uh, part of it is producing new knowledge, but synthesizing and translating existing knowledge. So there's a lot of information out there that's underutilized for decision making uh, to develop individual in innovative tools and technologies, new ways of cracking old problems. Um, to, uh, to translate that knowledge into guides that can be used uh, by practical decision makers in the policy and management world. And then it's always been part of the mission to build the next generation of students to invade that space. And uh, you know, if you look at federal hiring, of course federal hiring is going to be a little chilly in the upcoming years, but if you look at federal hiring, there's not GS14 interdisciplinary. There's GS-14 economist or GS-14 physical oceanographer. And so the typical patterns in universities and government have been to hire disciplinarians and then make believe they can work together mm -hmm. uh, to solve a problem. And uh, the new world, I think, is about training people at that interdisciplinary level or even transdisciplinary level from the get-go. Mm -hmm. How many languages do you know? And if you said, I want to do international uh, uh, management, international development, but I'm going to do it all in English or all in Japanese, you have none of the constraints, right? So uh, this solution space, number one, I just want to walk you through a few some examples. Um, one of the problems we have with evaluating whether the system's healthy or unhealthy or becoming less healthy or more healthy is how to monitor and measure what's going on in these systems. And because the ocean is such a big place, and we're terrestrial organisms, it's really hard to, for us to go into that space and spend a lot of time there figuring out what's going on. So we, we've done that very indirectly. And a lot of this is really fun field science. So you go out on a research vessel, or you go out with your scuba gear, uh, or you go out sampling in the environment to learn about uh, aspects of the environment. And it could be, uh, you could think a little bit like uh, the ocean health, human health analogy is you know, if I roll you into the emergency room with some kind of severe problem, you know, they don't just measure everything at once. They say, uh, hemorrhaging, yes or no. Breathing, yes or no. There are vital rates of blood pressure. You check that right away. So there are key things that you check to determine health. And if somebody's not breathing, then you don't say, well, let's send them for a CAT scan. You try to figure out how to get them to be breathing again, right? And then maybe if they have insurance, you send them. <coughs> right? um, so, so how to get at this monitoring problem is really difficult, and, and uh, we came up with an idea that I want to tell you about here because, and I'll illustrate with this glass of water. All of you are here on Monterey Bay, and you've probably all seen the whales and so on. It's really easy to observe whales. It's really easy to observe seabirds. Sea it's really hard to observe sharks or fin fish because they're below the water all the time. And so the question is, what would you say if I could tell you, if that were a glass of seawater, that I could take that glass of seawater and I could tell you which vertebrate animals are in the water today? You might say, you can't do that, right? But it turns out we're in the process of developing the technology to do that. Uh, there's something called environmental DNA. And in seawater, there, uh, there are tissues, there are uh, metabolic waste, there are cells, and the skin and the scales of fish and marine mammals and so on that leak DNA, okay? And it turns out you can harness the DNA revolution to look at this, and people have been doing this for decades with microbes because they're really small single cells and you can lice the cells and get the DNA and it's like dead easy. But can you assess tuna? Can you assess humpback whales? Can you assess sardines uh, by taking a water sample? So, uh, we got really interested in this possibility, and people have done it with microbes, but doing it with vertebrates, uh, where uh, the managers care a lot more about the assessment. Um, and you can do a variety of different approaches, like presence, absence, requires some kind of genetic approaches, which are pretty straightforward. So if you're trying to detect 
the distribution or change in the distribution of invasive species or endangered species like endangered white abalone along the California coast. You can put divers in the water and swim around until the cows come home and you won't see a white abalone. There might be, you know, even where they're dense, one per hundred square meters, and you can swim around all day and not see that one, but you can detect its DNA. If there's a white abalone there, you can find the evidence, uh, CSI style white abalone. If you're trying to uh, uh, find uh, an endangered uh, mollusk or something, or an invasive species, you can also detect their DNA. I've been working on a friend of mine who travels all over Southeast Asia, going up little rivers looking for endangered river dolphins. And she spends all this time in boats with field glasses looking for these river dolphins in turbid water. And you only see them if they pop out of the water. I said, you should first screen for their DNA, and that tell, tell you what rivers to look at. Because it could be 200 rivers you look at don't have any evidence of that species being there, but they're fine to do. You could spend all your survey effort in the fine to do uh, by using this approach. If you're interested in getting at relative abundance, of the stocks, there are other genetic techniques you can use to try to get at uh, community structure. And I'm not going to go into the details of the techniques, but I'll be happy to talk to you about it if you want to. And the gold standard would be to use the technique to get at absolute abundances. So rather than counting fish as they're caught by fishermen, you measure the DNA and figure out how many sardines there are out there and how they vary in abundance from year to year. We can do the first one quite well. The second one we're working on, and the third one is a hope that we should be able to do that. The place we started with this work was the Monterey Bay Aquarium. We said, look, we can go out and take a sample of Monterey Bay and say we found the DNA from X, Y, and Z, but we don't know who's out there. So let's take the ocean at Monterey Bay Aquarium, act like it's a blacked out test tube, dip up a liter of water and say, can we nail the species that are in that tank? And the aquarists know exactly which species are there and what relative abundances and all this kind of stuff. And we published this paper um, back in 2014, 2015, <clears throat> which basically shows we can use environmental <coughs> DNA using these uh, uh, multi-species primers, vertebra primers, to census marine fishes at the scale of the Monterey Bay Aquarium tank. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't detect the green turtle, but if you go with a specific probe to detect the green turtle, the green turtle DNA is there, and you could detect them. Uh, we had some issues with sharks. So it's a matter of refining the techniques, but it turned out for the four finfish species that are in that tank, we got all four species in their relative abundance. And you can say, well, that was easy. You know what's in there. Well, yeah, that's, that's how you test whether the technique is, is useful or not. Um, the next step was a field validation in Monterey Bay. This was done at Hopkins uh, at the Green Life Observatory right there in the Kelp Forest. And divers regularly survey that area. And so you have scuba divers. They go and they swim transects, they swim just off the sandy beach, they swim in the seagrass, they swim two transects in the kelp, they, kelp. they swim a transect beyond uh, in the rocky reef. So they're counting all the fish that they see uh, on that, which species they see on that particular day. Halfway through that transect, they grab a liter of water. And then you say, does the DNA see the same thing that the, the observers saw? It turned out that the DNA missed one species of uh, goby that the divers saw, but it saw twice as many species as the divers saw. And it also distinguished communities at the level of like 60 meters away on the water, you get distinct communities. And you might expect in the ocean out there, it's very active, all the DNA would get mixed together. No, 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 it's, it's, only, uh, it's, it's only there for a couple days at most. It decays, and so it gives you a snapshot of what was there. And so maybe the fish, maybe the divers didn't see these fish because they were there yesterday and left their DNA. The divers didn't miss anything; they just had moved on, or uh, or uh, the divers didn't see them because of the complexity of the environment. But what this suggests is that we can we can use eDNA to map at the relative abundance of many of these species, maybe at a level that's as good as diving. And of course, my friends who are scuba divers are saying, I don't want to be put out of the scuba diving business. I want to go swim transects and see if the Marine Life Protection Act reserves that we have on this coastline are working or not. So you put divers in the reserves and outside the reserves, and you count fish and you say, are they working? But you could potentially, when this technique is refined, take a water sample. And you can take a lot more water samples than you could put divers in the water. Uh, the cost of doing these sequencing 
uh, in the last 10 years has fallen six orders of magnitude per sequence. It's really cheap. We can run all the species in a sample for like 25 bucks. And it's hard to put a diver in the water for a day. You can't put them in the water for a day for 25 bucks. So we also wrote a paper for Science Policy Forum. Uh, this is Science Magazine's once, uh, once an issue. They have something that's specifically focused on policy. And we published a paper just laying out this idea, saying to you know, alerting managers, this is coming. Not ready for prime time, but it's coming. And a lot of people around the world are now investing in this research, not just to learn about the biodiversity <coughs> of what's there, but to specifically be able to give guidance to managers about what's there and what's not there. And not just for a particular species, but for the suite of species that are there. Um, and so this is a really exciting development as far as I'm concerned because it's pushing the envelope on the science, but it's pushing it toward practical management decision making. Uh, if you go to people who are planning the monitoring of the Marine Life Protection Action Act reserves on this coast, and you say, what about EDNA? They say, well, I don't know, that's all new. We know we're not sure if it's going to work. And I would agree with them. That's a good assessment. But give us a few years, because people around the world are now working on this idea. Um, the second thing that we focus on is trying to advance research and knowledge about coupled human natural systems. And so I don't even think anymore, even though I'm trained as an ecologist, about systems un unimpacted by people. People are part of green ecosystems for me and should be in everybody's mind if you're thinking about them as somehow separate. Um, that leads, that's an old way of thinking about. It. So marine systems are good and humans are bad. Humans are the destructors. But, and humans do a lot of damage to marine ecosystems, but humans are also the only actors who can fix them and reduce that damage. And so thinking about coupled human natural systems is really, really important, but it requires, again, thinking across disciplines in ways that some people find uncomfortable. Uh, the example I'm not going to have a lot of time to go into, but we've been working on are small-scale fisheries. Um, and, and this is a big overlooked sector uh, in fisheries management. 99% of the research in fisheries management has been large-scale industrial fisheries run by corporations. And 95% of the people who fish fish in small-scale fisheries in the small coastal zones around the world. Uh, small-scale fisheries, you say, well, you know, they don't have much of an impact. Well, it turns out when you towed up their impacts, they remove as much biomass from the ocean as the industrial fisheries. So the fact that we've spent 95% of our resources understanding 5% of the people who make a living fishing um, and half of the harvest means we've, lit, we've left something major out. So for the past four or five years, we've had a small-scale fisheries working group that's working with experts from around the world to synthesize the information on the impact of small-scale fisheries, but more importantly, to explore practical ways that small-scale fisheries could be managed in a way that's more sustainable. And when you start working on small-scale fisheries, it's very different than thinking about managing corporations because you're impacting the lives of people <laughs> and the livelihoods of people and their well-being and what they live to do. Uh, and so in a lot of cases, governance is at the village level or the cooperative level, not at the government level. So it's a really rich social ecological system uh, to work on. And um, one of the papers that I was involved in publishing just came out this summer <coughs> is, uh, is called Hot Spots in Coral Reef Management. And what we did in that paper, it was published in Nature, um, you know, we had data from 4,300 reef ecosystems. And we looked at features of those reef ecosystems, including the biophysical ecology, the oceanography, and the productivity, but also um, the proximity of human populations, the links to economy, uh, were they selling into an international market or selling just for local consumption and so on? And you throw that, all that into the model and the hotspots come from building a statistical model that gives you the average performance across 4,300 reefs around the world for how you would, how, what we'd expect the performance to be for a system that's at this latitude with this kind of productivity, with this kind of local population and all that stuff. And then, then what we did was look for the spots that were way better than expected or the spots that were way worse than expected. I mean, people have used this uh, in various medical uh, situations to say, so the children in this village are way healthier than the children in this other village, They're, but they have the same economic background and so on. So why are these children doing so much better than these children? If we could figure that out, we could help the children who aren't doing so well. <clears throat> so 
the, the hotspots analysis allowed us to identify what are the factors that cause reef fisheries in particular to overperform or underperform. Underperforming should be obvious. If you send into large markets that are uncontrolled, the reefs do better, do worse than you'd expect. If you introduce technology like refrigeration, the reefs do worse than you'd expect because the fishermen can catch everything and store it for sale rather than just harvesting for today. What ended up leading to overperforming reefs, the reefs that are doing really well, have to do with <coughs> communities that are highly dependent on the reef resources, that are highly engaged in managing them, or monitoring and managing their own resources for their own benefit. Because their life is on the line, they get it right. And those reefs are performing exceptionally well. So in the big paper published in Nature, the drivers of whether reefs are exceptional or exceptionally good or exceptionally bad are almost entirely in the human dimension. It's not about the ecology, it's not about the oceanography, it's about how humans interact with those resources seems to be the major driver. Um, so uh, another solution space is about fostering um, uh, relationships to policy and managers. Um, and I, I want to talk about a new uh, management thing that we're doing and, or suggesting exploring. I was talking to Jason about this. It's called dynamic ocean management. I'm not going to get to this example I'm showing you right away, but the notion is that people have said for oceanic pelagic organisms like seabirds and sharks and turtles and marine mammals, you can't manage them by using marine protected areas because they move. And then you swim outside your marine protected areas and that doesn't work. But what if the marine protected areas could move? Okay, and it, back in 2000, 16 years ago, uh, somebody who was actually a postdoc with me wrote a paper just before I hired him suggesting this idea that we could have potentially mobile marine protected areas. If we could model how these animals move that are subject to bycatch or how these animals move that are subject to ship strikes, we could figure out when they're in the footprint of a fishery and then somehow regulate the fishery when they're there. Um, and maybe you could protect these highly migratory species with protected areas that move. And the protected areas could be no fishing, or the protected areas could require special fishing gear. Depends what you want to do. But it turns out that in fisheries management, we do use big closures, sometimes to protect pelagic species, but they're fixed closures. And on first principles, when the target of the fishery moves, when the fishermen move, when the bycatch species move, and you're using a static management approach that should strike you as wrong on first principles. And I would posit it is wrong <laughs> on first principles. And there was a, we're working right now with a swordfish fishery uh, along this coastline. And they had bycatch issues with sea lions and leather bats and all kinds of things. And it led to very restrictive uh, practices, um, management practices for the fishery. Some environmentalists just want to close it down. We don't have a dog in the fight whether they close it down or not. What we're looking at are there alternative ways manage this fishery. Why keep a domestic swordfish fishery in place? The U.S. is the number two consumer of swordfish. And we can get our swordfish from a domestic fishery that we understand. That's right here off our coastline. Or we can close that fishery and get our swordfish from God knows where, where we do God knows what. And because I've studied global bycatch, I know that that God knows what is not what you want to dip into. It should be something that you know that you can observe and you can manage. Um, a, re a colleague published a paper just this year in Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences where he developed a cartoon model but it says, what if you had a big, back, big box closure to protect a typical pelagic uh, predator from bycatch in a long line fishery, for example, and it was a fixed box for all year, and then you said, what if these animals move through that box for a year? What if I can make a small box and that box moves so in January it's here, in February it's here, in March it's here? How big would the small box have to be to achieve the same goals that you achieve with the big box closure? The answer is 15 or 20 percent, which means you could leave the other 80 percent open to fishing because the chances of having a bycatch event in those places that are open are really low if you can predict where the bycatch is likely to occur. I use, I try to come up with an analogy that I could use on like legislators. I said, so here we go. You're in Washington, D.C., and they're moving the president around in Washington, D.C. from one meeting to another, or they're hauling him over to Congress or something like that. They don't close the entire city. 
they close the route that the president's going to take. And they usually have a couple backup routes that they close. And the people in Washington, D.C. consider this to be an intrusion on their day to night. Like, I can't even walk across the street if it's blocked off for a presidential motorcade. But they don't close the whole city. Okay, so um, there are ways to do this dynamically, and I have other metaphors if you want to talk about them. But this is a really cool case which combines the idea of dynamic management with climate change. And this is a paper that Elliot Hazen, uh, who works at NOAA right over here, did with a group of us. And what he did was use satellite tracking data and oceanographic data to predict the habitats of uh, 15 species of large pelagic predators including shearwaters and albatrosses and albacore and other bacterials, you can read the list. And what he did was say, so now if I can predict their habitats, I can run the ocean climate models ahead 50 and 100 years and say, where will their habitats be 100 years from now? Okay, and we're trying to understand how to conserve these ocean pelagics. You can't conserve them this year and hope for the best. You have to know about where they move seasonally and where they move over time with climate change, and what he found, this shows a couple key species for tunas, or the gilded tunas, from now until 2100, the actual amount of ocean space that will be habitable by them goes up, so they're winners. They're going to net more space in the ocean in the future. The sharks, as a gild, are going to lose space in the future, and the red and blue red reflect what happens to various species, like uh, shearwaters and albatrosses and <coughs> albacores do well under climate change in terms of total habitat volume, the sharks do much less well, the waterheads do much less well, just based on how climate change is going to influence habitat space. There's also the issue of how that habitat space is actually allocated. Uh, albatrosses that nest in the Northwest Hawaiian Islands, the moms and the dads, fly a thousand kilometers to the North Pacific Convergence Zone to feed when they're provisioning their chicks. They're gone for several days, they fly back, they feed their chicks, they fly a thousand kilometers back up to get food. That whole system is going to be a thousand kilometers further north under climate change. And there's no place for these albatrosses to move their nesting habitats to another place. So where we'd expect them to go to provision their chicks 50 and 100 years from now, it's going to be much more challenging to do energetically than now. And in some cases, they're barely making it now. Uh, so it suggests a lot of issues that when you start thinking ahead for climate change, it's really interesting to think about. The final thing that we really have focused on is enhancing capacity and leadership, both among students, and some of you have been involved in some of these activities, but also among current practitioners. Like, if we could help them do their job better, if we could help them explore some of these innovative solutions and decide whether there's something they can, on, uh, they can onload to what they do, and that's good. Um, you know, some of you here are part of the marine network that the Center for Ocean Solutions puts together. Um, this is a, a ocean-focused graduate education group that's the seven Monterey Bay universities. Um, and uh, we have monthly meetings and special trainings and stuff. We're doing a, a full off two-week policy course this summer with students from all of the institutions, including Ms. CSU and the Boston and you know that you know, the players, and it turns out because the people come from those different programs are in programs that emphasize different uh, expertise. If you're going to the Naval Postgraduate School, you're going to get a lot of physical oceanography. You're not going to get a lot of economics, okay? Um, you're not going to get a lot of languages and policy um, uh, there that you might get here, for example. Um, as part of the program, we've also had from the beginning the Early Career Fellows, and as I said, these are people who have a PhD in the sciences, natural or social sciences, a JD or an MBA. Um, there are about a half a dozen of them, they, and they're with us for um, one to three years. Um, and each of them come in with strong disciplinary training, but they work in interdisciplinary teams, trying to solve problems in the real world uh, for that period of time. And they go out with incredible, incredibly broader capabilities than they come in at. Um, so, Let's talk about some solutions, or what I think are emerging solutions. Um, one is one that we've worked on with Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. Uh, they invented this device that you see to the right called an environmental sample processor. And this is like uh, a genetic uh, PCR lab in a can. 
it takes water samples and it extracts the DNA and it sequences the organisms and it tells you within minutes, uh, in this case most of the applications are water quality, you get have harmful bacteria in the water that might want to cause you to put out an alert saying don't swim or surf. Um, and uh, this has been deployed in a fixed canister like this. They're also preparing it to deploy on, a, on an AUV that can swim around and sense those organisms. Um, almost all the stuff they're doing now is microbial uh, because it's really easy to, and, and it, it can target multi-species or it can tar target single species. But the payloads are you know, 20 to 40 of these uh, things, uh, water samples in different places. And it begins processing the samples and it basically calls in with the DNA uh, that it identifies, which species is it seen where. Um, and the, one of the applied notions would be to work with the water quality agencies along these coastlines who are taking a water sample and the traditional approach has been take a water sample, put it in the pickup truck, drive it to a lab, you know, plate it out, cook it for 24 or 48 hours and say, oh man, you shouldn't have been in the water on Thursday. <laughs> um, and what this can do is take a sample, and if it's in situ, it can take a sample at night in the morning and tell you by noon whether it's safe to be in the water. Uh, some of the tourist people don't want to know that. <laughs> they would rather not have those other species so available. Uh, but there's also uh, work on uh, a suitcase sized device so the water quality person who drives around in the pickup truck could take the water samples and pour them in, and while he's driving to the next spot, it processes the last sample. So you don't wait until you've been out all day and then process those samples over two days. You process them quickly so that the time uh, is useful. We've also worked really intensively with coastal managers on how they can include ecological principles into their planning. And this is one of the documents that we produce, which is a synthesis of a lot of complex science information, but put in terms that are very practical for managers. And in addition to providing them the uh, guidebooks, we also teach short courses so that they can adopt that information as quickly as possible. Uh, this is one of my favorites, and, and my new lever um, is to publish papers in Science Policy Forum, uh, magazine Science, and the Policy Forum issue that are specifically timed to lever a decision. Um, and uh, early in my career, I was just happy if I could get a paper published. Now I'm really greedy. I want to publish a paper in a particular place at a particular time. Okay? And if you want to have influence on policy, timeliness and salience are the issues. Right? You publish the paper at the wrong time, it has no impact. If you publish it in a low profile place, it should have no impact. But if it comes out in Science Magazine the week before the meeting, it's hard for them to ignore. So on the left here, we have a paper that we published in 2015. And the, the story was. The International Seabed Authority, um, which is an international body that makes decisions about allocating mining leases for, the <coughs> floor, uh, for metals and a variety of other kinds of things. Um, it's an internationally approved agency, but they have two missions. One is to encourage mining of the seafloor. Two is to protect key seafloor habitats because they're very vulnerable. Some of them are, once you stir them up, it's going to be tens of thousands of years before they're back. So part of their mandate was to make protected areas in the context of where they allow mining. And this is the clarion clip and fracture zone uh, in the Pacific. You can see where it's placed. Um, it's 80% of the size of the continent of the United States. So this is, in Donald Trump's terms, huge. Um, and what, what, uh, because the mining companies are pushing hard to get mining leases, uh, Seabed Authority was giving out mining leases, and actually a group of scientists independent from the Seabed Authority proposed these marine protected areas, and while they were debating the marine protected areas, they kept giving out mining leases, and they eventually put the marine protected areas in place in 2012 um, on a two-year basis, um, and some of them had to be moved, as you can see, outside the footprint of the Clarion and Clipper fracture zone because they gave away too many leases. Um, so by the time they got the protection area, protected areas in place, Based on the science, the best places to put them are already gone or given away. So what we did was write this paper reminding the Seabed Authority that you have responsibility, it's your own mandate to do the environmental protection while you're doing, while you're promoting deep sea mining. Um, it turned out this paper was so influential, the staff of the Seabed Authority handed it out at the start of the meeting. It came out one week before their meeting, and at that meeting they locked down these protected areas. 
And they also promise that when they go to other locations, like the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, they'll work on the protected areas at the same pace they work on the mining leases. And I was just at a meeting a month or so ago where a team is working on protected areas for the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. And there are only three leases out there at this point. So they might actually get the protected areas in place before all the best habitats given away uh, for mining. But that was a very influential paper because all it did was hold the agencies feet to the fire for what they said they're responsible to do and say, the world is watching, are you doing this? Okay? Um, and, and it was really well received in the sense that they handed out the paper to the commissioners and it was discussed at the meeting. And one of our co-authors was actually there. And you know the, the feedback was, uh, yeah, thanks for holding our feet to the fire. That was really uncomfortable. But they also agreed that, you know, for the next sites that they're likely to move on to, and this is driven by mining interests, they'll try to keep the protected areas efforts uh, at, in, uh, ahead, ahead of the cart um, uh, and make sure those go to in place early. The second story is just from October. Um, one of my students, Cassandra Brooks, had been working for her entire dissertation with CAMOR, which is the, the convention for the Protection of the Convention for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources. Um, they have a similar agenda. It's 25 nations in the EU um, to, uh, to uh, manage the waters off Antarctica. Um, and um, and uh, they were established in 1980 as a treaty, or, treaty organization. Uh, they have fisheries there. They have multinational fisheries there. But they also have a mandate for environmental protection. Uh, so we wrote a similar paper um, about the two proposals that were in place, the Ross Sea MPA and the East Antarctic Peninsula MPA. And uh, Ross Sea had been to this commission six times and gotten turned down and eaten away and modified six times. And there was a huge effort to try to push the Ross Sea MPA into place. Um, and uh, this paper played probably a small role, but a significant role because it came out a week before the meeting <laughs> and it couldn't be ignored in the meeting. Uh, Cassandra tells me that people were very upset with her about this paper coming out and most of us who had more experience said, yeah, the cockroaches don't make it with the lights turned on. <laughs> so, so, you know, naturally they're uncomfortable because you're really holding your feet to the fire and bringing it to public attention and it got huge press coverage. And the good news is the Ross CMPA got approved uh, about Halloween or something, October 29th or 30th. It goes into place December, 1st of December uh, 2017. Um, and it has a lot of compromises built into it, uh, but it's the largest marine protected area in the world. It's the largest open sea marine protected area in the world. So uh, we played a small role in that, but what we hope is a pivotal role, right place, right time. Uh, it's like jujitsu, right? You can't, you can't brute force or take on these issues, but you can remember them at the right place at the right time. It's a matter of tipping the weight, <laughs> you know, rather than overpowering the policy process. And so, um, I'm two for two in the last two years on publishing policy forum papers that actually made a difference, and I'm going to try to keep the track record going. Good. The other thing that we do, of course, is. Uh, Beyond the Marine Program is run short courses, and these are photos of a short course we ran a couple years ago with graduate students from the region and four Pacific Islanders. And so it was really interesting to have the insight of people uh, from other countries that are trying to solve problems in their countries. This summer, uh, there will be another two week Marine Policy course that we'll run. Uh, it's available to MIS students to apply for it. So you should hear about that soon, but it's the last two weeks of July, um, and it includes a sleepover at the aquarium. <laughs> okay. So I just want to end with our, our mission here, which is all about serving the needs of decision makers uh, and helping them be able to consider more sustainable decisions for people and the environment. Um, and what we do is try to work with them to identify, clarify what the problem is, and then identify pathways to solutions Sometimes that are innovative, they're outside the box, they're not ways that people have done things before. And those are harder to get adopted, but often uh, after people get past the novelty, they say, well, I never thought about marine protected areas moving. Can we do that? We had, uh, back in 2013, we had a law school symposium at Stanford, and we had 200 
ocean law people from all over the world. And we said, so under the laws that you know in your country, under international law, could there be marine protected areas that move? And they, their response was, nobody ever asked us that question. Could it be done under existing regulations? There's nothing that says you can't do it. There's nothing that specifically authorizes you to do it. So what we're doing now is we've built the science case for a particular fishery, and we're beginning to work back into the policy and regulatory world saying, okay, so how can we begin to operationalize this case? And see, can we break it you know, in terms of trying to get it into the policy realm? So thank you very much. Hopkins study that you mentioned where the uh, eDNA found more species than mm -hmm. the divers. Did the divers then go out and try to find those species that, that e, the no, eDNA found to verify what was going on? No, what well, uh, when we looked at the species that the, the eDNA found that the divers didn't happen to see on that day, they were species that are known to be there. And people, species that are, that are common in those habitats. Oh, okay. and, and the species that we found in the seagrass are species that are found in seagrass. And the species that we found in kelp forest are found in kelp forest and not in seagrass. And so on. So this, the, the, the suspicion is they missed them. You didn't see them. You just swim through at a moment, right? Yeah. And if you're looking over here when the fish swims by over there, you miss it, right? Uh, so for common species, you're not likely to have a problem. But for less common species, you might. And furthermore, the DNA is, uh, we know now, uh, cumulative. You can read the DNA for about, at, at ocean temperatures here, for about 48 hours. We've done the tank experiments where you put a whole bunch of fish in the tank, and you take a DNA sample, and you take another DNA sample, and then you take the fish out, and you take a water sample every four hours. And you say, in two days, you can't detect that they were there. Right? Uh, and so it's really a good tool, because it's not like, you take a water sample in Monterey Bay and you can detect from the glacial, the glacial period. Mm. It's telling you recent occupants. It just seems if the divers had gone out and then verified they were there, it would have been su supportive yeah. of your technique. Well, and you know, and some of the species, like one of the sites that we had that the divers didn't go to is the buoy that's in the middle of Monterey Bay. Mm -hmm. So you go out there in the buoy and you dip up a liter of water and what do you get? You get humpback whales. You get blue whales, you get gray whales, you get things that you know are out there. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so you know, it's it's really interesting because right now the gold standard is diver surveys. Okay. And you say, is it as good as diver surveys? Is it cheaper than diver surveys? Our answer is starting to look like that may very well be yes. There are issues to resolve still to be confident in that. But if it's seeing more than the divers saw for less money than it took yeah. to put a team of divers in the water, pretty soon. People are kind of doing the math. Maybe we should try to refine this technique. My, my other question is, have you thought about um, checking for uh, vaquita porpoise populations in the Gulf of California to see if maybe there really are more than, we, you know, they think there's about 60 and that's all? <laughs> uh, we, have, we haven't thought about doing that, but I think um, it, would be, it would be really easy because the genetics of vaquita are known, and designing a primer that's vaquita-specific it would be very straightforward to do, and you could go over the entire Pacific Ocean and Maybe see. Maybe there's a lot more. Vaquita they're hard to find. They're so. hard to see. That's true. But given that there are more vaquita scientists than vaquita looking for vaquita, <laughs> <laughs> I always teach my friends who work on right whales in the Northwest Atlantic. Yeah. There's like 300 right whales and 600 people who study right whales. <laughs> you should just assign somebody to stay with each of them. 24/7, <laughs> you can protect them. Right? <coughs> So, so I, mean, I think your, your point's well taken. I, I think for something like Bikita, they've been so carefully studied that I doubt that we're missing anything. But the, the woman that I was talking about that works on the river dolphins, the river dolphins who used to be distributed among hundreds of tributaries in Southeast Asia, and now they're, they're maybe extinct or they're extremely rare. You know, people see one every few years, right? But that means you just come across them. And right now, she's doing surveys in places where people have come across them and all kind of stuff. And it's fun stuff, because you're out in field glasses and a little boat and all that kind of stuff. But it's also hard work. I mean, it's, her, her work seems like Indiana Jones to me, but she's out there. And she has stories about being captured by 
uh, bandits and then having the Indian army come to rescue her and it's worse being with the Indian army than being with the bandits. <laughs> but you could design a water sampling procedure and you just go to those tributaries and you could go to a hundred of them in a week and take the water samples and say which ones did we see DNA for this particular species and then hone in uh, it's like assaying ore for gold, right? You don't go mine gold every place. You do the assay and you say, this gold here. And I, I've told her about that two or three times. She hasn't adopted it yet, but I keep poking her because it seems like something that would be really efficient. And of course, my friend Mark Carr, who dives the transects out here in the MLPA and has been a lifetime scuba diver, he was very upset about eDNA because he said, I don't want to, I like scuba diving. I like doing what I do. You're like taking my job away. And I have a whole bunch of students who like scuba diving. Uh, and I said, yeah, but you could be scuba diving, learning really interesting things about the system, not just trying to count the fish, right? So if there are ways to streamline this with technology, um, you know, I'm, I'm for doing it. Uh, but uh, I, you know, just to be honest, we're still in the R&D stage with this. We're looking at the cakes, but what we've got so far is very promising. Yep, back there. I just wanted to ask um, about the eDNA. How do you account for how much the water moves, right? Because theoretically, the water can move a long distance in two days. So how do you know you're not? Yeah, so, so we've tested it so far in really safe places, right? Like the Monterey Bay Aquarium Outer, outer Bay Tank. <laughs> it's an enclosed ocean. So that's the first place to do it. It's logical. It was brilliant to go there. But the next place we went was in a kelp forest where water movements are pretty baffled by the structure of the kelp and things like that. So there's, although if you take a physical oceanographer out there, they'll tell you how incredibly physically dynamic the water is there. It's pretty, it's pretty structured. Um, we're working on a, another project that's funded by, um, by NOAA called the Marine Biodiversity Observation Network. And if you know anything about oceanography, there are all kinds of observation networks where you put instruments all over the place to measure temperature and salinity and oxygen, things that are easy to measure. But very seldom does that include biological measures, like there's not uh, a, a humpback whale monitoring probe on those instruments. And so the Marine Biodiversity Observation Network is to try to build biological diversity instrumentation that can do measurements on the scale of the physics and chemistry, but about key biological features. And so we're in that right now part of a four-year project uh, that's run out of Ambari and University of South Florida to develop these techniques for offshore, and then you get into issues, right? Where the water that you take in a place, if, if the DNA reflects critters that have been in that water mass for the last 48 hours, then you need to know where that water mass was 48 hours ago. But the physical oceanographers have some handle on that. It turns out when you push them hard, they really can't do it at that scale of resolution. But if you're gonna, if you're gonna do that kind of thing, you need to recognize that you do need to consider the space. So if you went out to the MLPA reserves offshore with a strong current flow and you took a sample in the reserve, you could be getting water that was outside the reserve very easily, like yesterday, right? So um, we, we haven't resolved those kinds of issues, but we're aware they're important to try to figure out. Yep. I, so I particularly like how uh, the center is, is calibrated and, and uh, like strategically positioned to influence policy right. and policy makers. And I was just thinking about um, you know communicating the science and and I suppose I have two parts to the question. Um, one, what else is the center doing to try and um, inform the public and, and other sectors that may influence policy in turn? Yes. Like journalists or yeah. Yep. Um, so we, we do have a communications group that's uh, two and a half people. Actually, that person's a whole person, but I'll never see time. <laughs> um, and and uh, you know, they actually do communications, and we're very targeted with our communications. Our first audience is decision makers, not sixth graders, you know, not Joe Sixpack. It's decision makers, and so we're in communication intensely with the decision makers. And from the get go, like, what do you need to know to do your work better and can we can we coerce the researchers that are at Stanford and associate universities to actually do research that decision makers care about and that's that's a learning curve also um, but we have uh, we have a website we have an active social media sort of thing we make short films 
Uh, we tweet out results, we produce press releases, uh, and circulate them, uh, and so on. So we have a pretty broad outreach, but our target isn't like the public. Our target is decision makers. So we're trying to get to people who work in agencies, we're trying to get to people, legislators, and things like that, who could make it a difference, make a difference close to the problem. And, and that doesn't mean that we don't think the public, what the public thinks matters. We're just trying to go for the immediacy. And then I suppose the other part was, uh, you mentioned um, you know, suggesting people to try and get a, a, a behind the scenes tour of the aquarium. If you're a normal resident here in Monterey, how might you go about that? Well, actually, if you're, if you're an aquarium member, you can actually request a behind the scenes tour. Oh, okay. Um, and and uh, I, I think it costs some amount of money per person. Like 12 yeah. bucks. Like oh, 12 bucks or 15 bucks or something. And what they'll do is have one of the, one of the volunteers walk you through. Um, I have special access because I'm a friend of Steve Webster, who's one of the founders. And so I call up Steve and I say, Sue, can you walk us through my marine conservation class or the marine policy class in the summertime? And if Steve's available, he'll come and meet us and walk us through. And you get, you get the dinner and the fork show. I mean, because Steve is telling the story of the invention of Monterey Bay Aquarium while he's walking around showing you all this. And I first discovered that by being a pushy faculty member from Duke University. And I grew up out here, but I'd never been behind the scenes. And I just called up the aquarium and I said, I'm a marine ecologist at Duke University. I'm gonna be on the West Coast. Can I get the behind the scenes tour? And they actually gave me Steve Webster. And mm -hmm. They gave me Steve Webster because they said, well, you're a VIP. And I said, oh, I'm a VIP? <laughs> cool, I had no idea, right? And so my first turn was just with Steve Webster. And what I wanted to see is like the bowels of the, Aquarium, like down in the control room, and the big pipes and water flow and stuff. It's freaking amazing. And, and what's strange about it is the technology that you see is like the moonshot technology. I mean, they built the aquarium and opened it in 1984. So all of the instrumentation that's still down there is circa 1980, but they really run the whole thing from a laptop now. And if you're, and they used to have people in the control room, like four people all night, 24 7. And now, if something goes offline or the oxygen reading goes too high, it calls somebody from the laptop and they can go onto the laptop and fix, adjust the valves, and it's all crazy cool. So if you're, if you're kind of a techno wonk, it's totally fun to see. And then behind the scenes at the aquarium, you also see that those deep, dark tanks that have all the jellyfish in them are about this deep. Yeah. yeah. I, I want to roll back to the something you said, uh, that you're hoping to get a high definition process to the eDNA yep. that would what, supplant, replace, complement the, just the body head count, sending a diver into the sea and doing a head count. Can a head count be done with eDNA or just presence? Of it? Well, right now we can do presence absence, okay? And, and, uh, and I didn't tell this as part of the story, but in the aquarium, for the four species of fin fish that were in there, we got relative abundance from this even crude technique. When we applied it in the MLO out in the field, we also got all of the fish that they saw plus some, uh, and we got this relative abundances of them. What is relative abundance? Well, it's, yeah. just, it's just like, it, it's it rather, absolute abundance is say, in Monterey Bay, mm -hmm. there are 102,364,832 sardines. Okay. Or you can say, there's four times more sardines than there were last year, or there are four times more sardines than there were last month. That would be relative abundance. Is, so, that, a, is, that, a, is that a head count thing, or is that an EDA assessment? Well, you can do it both ways, right? When they do a head count, to be honest, they're getting relative abundance, right? Mm -hmm. They swim a transect and they say, we saw four, four times as many fish on this transect as this transect. How many fish are there out there? They don't have a clue, right? And so the eDNA can do presence, absence, it can do relative abundance. What it can't do and didn't work in the MLO was you can, if you, if you say the abundance of species A, pick a species, you know, black rockfish, um, wherever you sample black rockfish, you get them, the eDNA gets the same relative abundance as the observers. So where the observers see a lot of black rockfish, you get a lot of DNA hits, right? But that only applies to black rockfish. And if there's another species, you get its relative abundance, but you can't compare a black rockfish with another rockfish because 
the, the rate at which they leak DNA or the rate at which the process actually tracks their DNA differs. So even with the techniques we're using, we can get within species relative abundance. Cross species relative abund abundance is all about like primary design and whether we can figure out how to beat that. But um, given that we're like, the whole field, th this was first done in like 2012, 2013 in freshwater. The first work is in marine systems is like 2014. So like we're, I think, kicking ass <laughs> in terms of making progress on this. And there, there are a lot of kings to work at, and there are a lot of people that are skeptical. Um, the the postdoc, who, two postdocs walked into me, the early career fellows, and they said, we have an idea. We think we could use eDNA to monitor the MLPA reserves. And I said, okay, well, that's wild and crazy. I don't understand the genetics, but what would it cost to try this out? And they wanted to do the experiment in the aquarium. And they got permission from the aquarium and all that kind of stuff. And they said, well, we would need maybe like $50,000 to do the sequencing. We would just, we can go do the work and collect the samples and filter them and all ourselves, but we need to send them off for sequencing. And so that paper came out for $50,000. Subsequently, we have raised like a million and a half for that work. So for me as science director, that $50,000 becomes a million and a half is like the best results. It's like the diet commercial. This is the guy who really lost weight, right? Um, and most of the examples, the guy doesn't really lose weight that well, but eDNA has been a hit. Uh, in that regard, and I, you know, there's a, you know, right now, I mean, I was at uh, a meeting of international marine conservationists called the Pew Fellows meeting, and there are like 200 of the top people in the world, and there was a whole session for the second year on environmental DNA, and it's going like wildfire among researchers. And what we're trying to do is keep the eyes on the prize that we want something that managers can use, not just use it as an exploratory tool. Yeah, my last question. I, I'm a public geographic educator, and I think that the public should be informed of what we in the, in, in the, in the academia are doing, yep. that if nothing else is informative and educational, mm -hmm. uh, you said that the, the, one of the principal, if not primary reason for doing the work is to intersect with policymakers, yep. inform and educate them. Is there an effort to do the same, N not necessarily to to create policy, but to at least keep the public, you know, aware, informed, and it was an influence. Yes. Well, okay, so one reason I'm here is because you all are the public, but, you know, if, if you've got other groups that you think would be interested in hearing some of this stuff, you know, like, so invite me, you know, buy me a couple the of groups. The grammar is very complicated. <laughs> yeah. The grammar is very complicated. No, no, no. And, and, you know, I mean, I, 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 I practice this. I mean, I teach college students, but I've also given talks to my daughter's preschool class. You know, my wife taught preschool age four, so you're going to tell sea turtle biology to four-year-olds. You have to, like, not dumb it down. You just have to put it in terms that they engage in. So, um, but, you know, I mean, we, 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 our main communication goal is it to communicate with Audubon Society or, or you know, a community group or something like that? But you know, if there's an interested group of people, I mean, we give talks at the aquarium, we give talks at the universities. Hopkins Marine Station has a Friends of Hopkins uh, Marine uh, Station meeting once a month, uh, and they have talks there, and we've given talks in that program. So, um, you know, if there's something particular that we do that you're interested in. You should approach us, and you know, if we can find time to talk to you, we will. Yeah. What do you th What do you think? Like, <clears throat> knowing that, knowing what Miss teaches us, like, what could you give an example of a job that would be possible for us to do? Like, I don't have a strong science background, but like you said, okay, I tell me what Miss Tell me what Miss has taught you to do. Ah, it's my first semester, so. Uh, <laughs> okay, <laughs> some second year. Tell me what Miss has taught you to do. <laughs> I. Quite a bit, I suppose. Um, being put on the spot. I, I mean, everything from from fisheries management to uh, natural resource uh, management policy to um, economics of uh, uh, you know coastal economies or or um, you know kind of like the unseen economy of a uh, of ecosystems. Um, you know, it's just a whole spread of things. Yeah. You know, uh, well, I'm a big fan of the program at MISS, and I was for 15 years at Duke in the Master's in Environmental Management program there, and it was all interdisciplinary. 
they did a project, but not a thesis. Uh, they worked in interdisciplinary teams. Uh, the Bren School at Santa Barbara has a program, and our our uh, main <coughs> at Duke, our main audience for our students was actually people who wanted to work in federal or state agencies, uh, and permitting and research and research evaluation and communications, whatever. And you know, after that interdisciplinary program, they could write their ticket. It was really easy, really easy. Bren's special area is training people to work in consultancies for NGOs, for businesses, and things like that. And they place people in those positions routinely. They don't even do independent projects, individual projects. They do projects in teams of three or four or five, which is, surprise, exactly how you work in the real world. Right? So the whole idea of training people to be independent scientists is not how interdisciplinary problem solving happens. It's about being able to work in teams. And so being able to play nice with others is as important as your technical skills, and again, remember the how many languages do you know analogy. I don't have to be an economist, but I have to know if an economist is bullshitting me or not, right? Yeah. I mean, I have to kind of listen to it and say, oh, I'm sorry, I don't know very much economics, but that doesn't make any sense to me, and be able to tell who's giving me the straight shot and who's not, and be able to go to an economist and have developed a relationship with it I respect and say, okay, you have to explain this to me because I'm but a humble ecologist and I don't understand what's being proposed here. But if you don't have the language, like, I don't know very much Spanish, but I can order beer, I can find my way to the bathroom, those are key things, right? Um, and so if you're going to work into that culture, you need to have enough language to work with those groups. And if you just say, if you don't speak high energy physics, I can't talk to you, then you have a very limited group of people you can interact with. Does, does uh, Ocean Solutions, does it like have an international scientist? Um, well, you know, we're, we're grappling with that now because we've, we've focused, we have you know, quite a few international things that we do, global scale things that we do. There are two examples I thought about, talked about seabed authority and Camelar is international, right? It's not at the scale of whole oceans, but it's at pretty big scales uh, around the world. Um, our geography that we mostly concentrated on is California current and the wider Pacific. And, it, this system has so much stuff going on that's really interesting, and the density of research that's been done here, and the talent in the policy world, and the governance world, and so on, about the North Pacific is like the target-rich environment for somebody like me, because there's so much known that can be pulled together and synthesized. If you take dynamic ocean management, which we're developing here in the context of Barb Block's tagging of Pacific Pelagics program, which put satellite tags on 4,300 animals of 23 different species over 10 years, and you say, I want to go do that in the Patagonian Sea off uh, Argentina, and they want to do it. We say, so how many satellite tags do you have out on how many species? And they said, uh, a couple hundred, um, six species, and you just don't have the capability to take that on. But something like dynamic ocean management can also be done low tech. I was telling uh, Jason an example. There's there are the high tech kind of modeling things that we do where we forecast movements and stuff. There's one for Southern Bluefin Tuna off Australia that's regulatory. And they, they tell the fishermen you can't go into these boxes and then they find them if they do. The fishermen are tracked remotely with satellite tags. If you can tag a tuna, you can tag a fisherman. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 just, it's just all about like civil rights and Big Brother and all that stuff. But, but um, you know, if part of being admitted to the fishery is you have to be observed. It's like getting a driver's license. I can't just drive willy-nilly and not pay attention to the traffic laws. If I have the privilege of driving, I have to not run red lights. Right? Um, but there are low-tech things. One of my favorites is about scallops in New England. Um, and they're dredging for scallops with these big dredges that drag across the seafloor. And they were catching uh, a finfish species called yellowtail flounder. And yellowtail flounder are really valuable. There's another fishery for them. And there were, there were restrictions on how many yellowtail flounder the scallop fishery could kill. Right? They just set a hard cap and it's been in court and all that kind of stuff. You can kill so many, and when the fleet collectively kills so many, boom, you're shut down for the season. Well, they were getting shut down after that rule went in place, like a third of the way into the season, halfway into the season, tens of millions of dollars in losses. And somebody came up with a brilliant idea. You know what, I bet you there's a correlation between where they take yellow tail flounder on Tuesday and where they would take them on Wednesday. And so they have all the fishermen report where they took yellow tail flounder by these fisheries blocks that are out there. Somebody at the University of Southern Massachusetts in Dartmouth 
assembles all that data, they put it out the next day for the fishermen, and they just say, yeah, don't fish where the bycatch was high yesterday. Fish any place else you want, and report your catches that day, because you're going to find flounder in some places where we didn't anticipate them. Good. We update that and we give you a new map the next day. After that went into place for like five years now, they've stayed open the whole season and made another 10 or 20,000, 20 million dollars a year as a fleet. There's no regulatory requirement, there's no law. The fishermen say, well, that's cool. We can keep working. We can harvest, because there's no limit on, uh, or uh, there is a limit, but they don't hit the limit on scallops if they get shut down by yellowtail flounder bycatch. So really low tech, the fishermen data that's reported, that's aggregated, and served back to them, and they use it in however they see fit. But you don't want to be that guy who shut the season down by not taking advice. There's a similar program in Hawaii about bycatch of loggerhead sea turtles in the longline fishery. They have something called Turtle Watch. And it produces, just based on temperature isoplasts of the surface ocean, if you get into these temperatures on the warm side of the front out there, you're likely to catch loggerhead sea turtles. And you get to catch 30 a year, and boom, the whole US fishery closes. If you fish on the cool side of that front, the probability of probability of getting a loggerhead is much lower. So we, we put out this product every day, and you know Noah does this. They put it out every day, the fishermen decide where they want to make their sets, and if they want to set on the warm side, they do, they don't. But something like half the boats have observers on them. And when you tick off a loggerhead, that becomes that comes off the total for the entire fleet for the season. And again, nobody wants to be that guy that closes down the fishery, right? You get back and nobody will drink a beer with you. You know, you're gonna be shunned. And people, it gets around who it was, right? Uh, that did that. And so after the turtle watch went into place, they were also able to keep the seasons open much longer. Um, I, I was actually there uh, in Hawaii with a class back in the 2006, 2007, at a place called Pacific Producers. They run a long line fleet in the entire Pacific. And so we're there talking about long lining and you know a little bit about bycatch, but mainly we went to the tuna market and we're visiting with, a, with the, the, one of the guys who's the CEO. And while we were there, he gets the email that they've closed the fishery down because of bycatch. And I've worked on bycatch for my whole career, and you could like see the steam coming out of his ears. <laughs> And he stayed very diplomatic, and he was nice to, her, uh, to us, and he saw us the rest of the way uh, through our tour and discussion and stuff like that. But I, I thought he was going to knife me. You know? <laughs> and, and, uh, you know, it's because it has big, big repercussions for employment, for economy, and that kind of stuff. So solving these problems isn't just about, gee, I care about sea turtles. It's about also keeping the economy going for the fisheries and not having disproportionate restrictions on a, an economic activity. If you, can, if you could have marine protected areas that move and close 15% of the area, you would close with a fixed closure. Who, who doesn't want that deal? The fishermen want that deal. Rather than being closed down entirely, they'll take fishing in the other 80% every day. So the, the question is, can we make that a reality that we can convince both the fishermen and the, and the environmentalists that this is a bet worth taking or not? And, you should hang out and see what the answer is. <laughs> we'll, we'll probably know in a few years. Yeah. Uh, where do you see eDNA? How far out do you see eDNA beginning to take over the language of research? Oh, like how many years? Yeah. From uh, where, from what you said, you know. Well, when well, Ryan Kelly walked in the door, he said in five years we'll be doing this to monitor the MLPA reserves. And I said, <coughs> OK. <laughs> and Ryan, I'm glad you read like He's a young PhD, and he's all excited. And all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, I, it, we're, we're about four years into our effort, and I think we've got some really compelling results that are really getting a lot of attention. Are the, are the decision makers, monitor, people who manage the monitoring program, ready to jump to this? They're like s safely standing on second base, and you want to say, steal third, right? And so they, you know, they're going to use the traditional approaches, but the fundamental thing here is the traditional approaches aren't fundamentally correct. They're just the way we've figured out how to do it the best we can. You put divers in the water and you count fish, right? And that's better than pulling nets around and counting fish. So you put divers in the water. Um, but you know, I think, if I had to guess, we'll see the first applications. In fact, we're already seeing the first applications of eDNA for invasive species and for endangered species. 
That's like happening, and they're using species-specific probes to figure out is the range of an invasive species changing. And you can go out again until the cows come home and look for them. But if you're looking at, um, uh, and this happens a lot in freshwater, invasive mussels, you can swim around as a diver and look for invasive mussels in the rocks for a long time, or you can take a water sample and say they're in this tributary. And you know they're there, if their DNA bait is their baby, they're there, right? Um, so at this single species level, it's already happening. Um, when you get into describing whole communities, I would guess, you know, in a five to ten year window, it'll become a, a viable approach and it requires convincing a lot of people who have bought off on the current approach to say, okay, I'm willing to step off second base and run for third on this new technique and of course, you know, the process of changing those kinds of monitoring programs is really conservative, but the environmental sample process that I told you about, if you're monitoring uh, Ishirika coli or something else that's harmful to humans, that they shouldn't be in the water if that's in the water, right now it takes 48 hours to know that you shouldn't have been surfing that day. If you could know that the same day, who would want to, who, else, who would not want to know that, right? So the water quality managers, they're using the, basically the same tools except they don't know what it is, and they played it out on different media, and they say, oh, it's, it's the species we're concerned about. What this can do is sequence the DNA and tell you in a couple hours what you've got. Uh, and I think that's just a matter of making the technology, um, uh, building, right now they build these things as one-offs over at Ambari, uh, and you say, what does it cost to build one? I said, no, very large or something. But if they went into production, you might be able to produce these things for, let's be crazy and say they cost $10,000 a piece. You're paying a water quality technician $80,000 a year to go out and take samples, so $10,000 for an instrument is not like crazy high. I don't know what, when, when, that's all, when that's all put in a marketable form, what it'll actually cost. It's not going to cost that much. I don't think just so, just because of time, sorry. But so, what I'll do is right now, we can have Larry hang out here if people still have some questions or want to introduce themselves. I apologize, I'm just kind of getting, wanting that more on time. So let's uh, give them another round of applause.